up here in Jacksonville. And the museum here was one of our tour stops. And it was a very popular uh, stop, uh, the latest one, who attended there. And uh, we really appreciated that. So thanks very much for being here. I want to thank Bob Birch for uh, actually inviting me or getting the uh, nerve up to invite me. Uh, he read an article that was in the Florida East Coast Railway Society newsletter about Mineral City, and that uh, intrigued his attention, and he uh, wrote me and said that we can talk about it. He said I'd be glad to do it. So hopefully uh, this will interest you tonight. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Mendel City, the Mendels, the mines, the mines, the railways, and believe it or not, golf. You, you probably are wondering who is this gay who from 150 miles down the road come to talk to you about your local uh, ex-mining operation down there beneath the golf course. So I thought I'd better uh, say a little bit about where I'm coming from here. I am a third generation Floridian. Both my grandfathers got off the Florida East Coast Railway train at that little station up there over a hundred years ago, separately, a few months apart. They were both medical doctors. In fact, my dad's dad uh, opened the very first full-time medical practice in the village of Fort Lauderdale over a hundred years ago uh, when there were more Seminole Indians there anyone else. Um, so that's kind of where my interest in Florida history stems from, is the family that's been around a really long time. And then, because my dad used to take me down to that station, actually the, um, the second one, not the one you see there, uh, to watch trains go in and out. As a kid, I sort of developed an interest in trains and railroads, and it's still a closet hobby. So I'm a member of the FEC Railway Society. And as part of all of that, learned about Mineral City, learned that they had a railroad down there that actually connected with the Florida East Coast. And um, so my interest in trains comes in here. And then as a chemist, uh, even though I worked in the space industry for uh, semiconductor companies, um, the mineralogy of Florida has been a sideline interest as well. So all these things kind of converge on, on what went on at Mineral City, and, and that's kind of the where my interests come from. So that's enough about me. If we can get the slide to change. Oops. It changes, it changes quick. This is a geological map of the state of Florida that was drawn, I believe, in the 1950s. But the geologies don't change much over time, so it's just as accurate today, I think, as when the map was drawn. And the message in this slide is that Florida has the highest concentrations of ilmenite in the state, right where we are. From about the St. John's River down to below St. Augustine, right along the beach, uh, there are very rich concentrations of ilmenite, and that's the basis of the story about Emerald City. So what was it like back then? The beach down there, a few miles south of us here, uh, back in those days, the beach was about 500 feet wide at low tide. Uh, the beach ridges, or the dunes, uh, averaged about 13 feet high and are almost 200 feet wide back in those days. And those areas contain an average of about 20% of heavy metals just in the beach sand or in the dunes, roughly 20%, depending on where But certain areas of that ridge, certain parts of that dune, had what they called back in those days a friendship vein of minerals that was a couple of feet thick and maybe 30 to 35 feet in width, running laterally along the dune, sort of parallel to the ocean. And uh, those so-called friendship veins had up to 60% of heavy metal which made those dunes a viable mine for locating, pulling out, digging up, and shipping out certain uh, heavy metal or basic minerals from which heavy metals could be obtained, or other products as well. So here's some photos, and when we're done tonight, you can come up here and handle and 
look at some real handful of bedrooms to see what they really look like. All I had to show you was pictures. The, the bedroom of greatest interest uh, at Mineral City was this ilmenite down here in the lower left corner. It's actually iron titanium oxide, and that mineral is a good source of uh, metallic titanium when you extract the metal from it. Another mineral that was mined down there is um, rutile, which is titanium dioxide, also a good source for titanium metal. And another one down there is zircon, which is zirconium silicate in the lower right corner there. And uh, that's a good source of, of the metal zirconium, which has a lot of uh, interesting industrial applications. So this is a little bit more, by the way, how, how many people here uh, in high school or college took a chemistry class. How many just despised it? <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, you're going to get a little bored. <laughs> you thought you were done with chemistry, right? And then you come here. <laughs> anyway, uh, typically along the beach at Mineral City, uh, those sands at certain locations average about 50%, 55%. Uh, ilmenite, 20% of the zircon, 6% uh, of the rutile or titanium dioxide, and uh, a few other uh, minerals as well. Uh, some white minerals and coarse sand, you see the concentrations there. Um, but the first three in the list were the targets for the mining that went on down at, at Mineral City. So who did this? Who, who went down there and dug up the beach to get these men? Well, it was Mr. Pritchard and Mr. Buckman. Give me my so who, who were these guys? Uh, Henry Buckman was uh, the son of a Jacksonville lawyer. <clears throat> he had a degree in chemistry from Harvard, so he was a man after Miles Hart. Interestingly enough, he wrote a senior thesis at Harvard called Sands of Florida. And in that thesis, he reported there were no valuable minerals in the Florida <laughs> I actually went on the line to try to find this thesis <coughs> to see if Harvard had posted it. It's not there. <laughs> uh, he studied engineering in Germany, and he joined, and worked, uh, joined up with Mr. Pritchard uh, when they were doing some research and some work up in Indiana. George Pritchard came from Missouri and he grew up in Indiana, uh, studied at Colorado School of Mines, worked in Costa Rica, came back to the U.S. to do some engineering work in Indiana. So Buckman and Pritchard are the fellows who, um, who did all this down in Mineral City. So how did they come to get there? Uh, they started out by doing uh, mineral work in Indiana, uh, and they serendipitously found the ilmenite in the Florida Beach sand. <clears throat> and here's how it happened. Somebody, I don't know who, when they were working in Indiana, sent them a bag of sand. They had a fire in the lab. And I can remember in chemistry lab, we kept buckets of sand around to throw on fires. Fortunately, we never had to. But Buckman and Pritchard had to throw sand on their farm. And it went everywhere, as you can imagine. And when they got done, got the fire out, they happened to notice they had these sparkly little particles all over themselves from uh, putting out the fire. Well, they looked at them more closely, being mineralogists, and, and you read that there was precious minerals in that sand that somebody sent them in a sack from Florida. So they decided they'd better come down here and check this out. I <clears throat> came down to Florida and they actually surveyed the whole Atlantic coast from Savannah all around the Atlantic beaches and all actually all the way around to the Gulf of Mexico. And the only uh, stretch that they found that had uh, viable concentrations of the ilmenite that they were really interested in finding, because that's what was in the sand they drew on fire. Uh, was right here between the St. John's River and uh, an area south of St. Augustine. So it turns out 1,100, I, 
assume this figure is accurate. I don't really know. <laughs> what I read, they bought 19 miles of beach for 1,100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I moved to Melbourne, Florida, some years back, I had a chance to buy beachfront for $100 a foot. And I was too dumb and too stupid to even go borrow the money to do it. I had been these guys, I don't know if I'd spend $1,000 or 19 miles a beach, but there was nothing there. In those days, that was, that was swamp land, that was uh, just open beach, nothing there whatsoever, except, I guess, mosquitoes. So they, they um, took a risk, which paid off, it turns out. I assume this is Butlin and Pritchard. I really don't know for sure. <laughs> uh, but here they are uh, at the dune. Um, and you can, if you look closely, you can see some striations there in the, in the dune structure, <clears throat> which are these deposits of heavy metals that actually exist in the beach sand. Who would know? Who would have expected it? There's a closer up picture. You can see the black lines there that represent deposits of, of heavy minerals in the deep sand. Uh, I don't know how those got there. Uh, obviously, it's a sedimentation process. Obviously, there were some hydrological uh, events going on. Uh, and either, either the world evolved for four billion years and, and these deposits ended up there, or like the Bible says, the world was created by God. 4,000 years ago, there was a global flood which deposited those minerals. I don't know what you believe, but uh, that's uh, where they came from. So, Buckman and Pritchard uh, decided that there were viable deposits here that could be uh, mined and extracted. So, they bought that property down there at Ponte Vitra, built a process plant, and had them building. Residences, uh, residences for people, for workers, for living. And they started mining Florida's beautiful Atlantic Beach in 1960. Can you imagine today trying to start a mine on the beach? Do you think it would work? Who, who would you have to buy off and how much would it cost you to open a mine on the beach? So this is one of their old pieces of mining equipment. What was that? I, I wondered myself. I've got a mining but I don't remember. Yeah. But again, this is 1920s technology. So what they did is they went into the dune and they used it. We have a picture, I think, a couple more slides of the steam shovel or a dredge. They would actually dredge up the sand. They ended up making lakes, as you will see. All that sand, tons and tons and tons of it, was transported to a separation plant that they built by either trucks or by river. At that plant, the sand was mixed with water, and the heavier mineral-rich ores separated out, settled out to the bottom of those, those uh, tables, those shaker tables. And uh, the water was drained off. The, uh, the uh, deposited ore product was uh, dried out and put in bags or in bulk and shipped out. Uh, I guess one of the principal customers was Titanium Pigment Company uh, out in Missouri. So like I said, Mineral City's history and existence is unavoidably intertwined with chemistry. So if you really despise that class, now's your chance to leave. Because so I'm going to throw some at you. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the door's not locked. You can get out. This is the periodic table. And the two elements, uh, see, we had one person. <laughs> periodic table of the elements and the two that I've circled in red, titanium, zirconium, 
are the two heavy metals that were the principal products that ultimately came out of the city. So why was the ilmenite important? Remember I showed you the pictures of the iron titanium oxide and the rutile, which was titanium dioxide. Um, that's the starting material for making titanium tetrachloride, TiCl4, or you can call it tickle for short. Chemistry. You can take the iron titanium oxide reacted with chlorine throw in a little carbon, mm -hmm. and that will all react, and the product you get out of it is titanium tetrachloride, get some iron chloride and some carbon monoxide out of that reaction. What you're after is the titanium tetrachloride. And whether you believe it or not, that's actually a balanced equation. <laughs> balanced equation. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is that tickle important? It's a chemical intermediate to make uh, titanium dioxide, which is the white pigment that uh, is in your paint today, and uh, it's important um, uh, industrial product even back in the times of the city. Still important today, all kinds of stuff made out of uh, titanium. This is a impeller disc out of a jet engine, uh, an artificial hip joint, golf clubs. Isn't that an interesting irony? Yeah. And um, uh, medical devices, that one down there at the bottom, I have one in my wrist, which I broke about a year ago, and the doctor rebuilt it with titanium plates and screws. And, you know, the precious metal prices go up, I'm selling. <laughs> uh, there's the titanium tetrafluoride itself. It's actually a liquid. I was going to bring a flask of it to show you, but it's kind of unpleasant stuff. So we'll just look at it on the screen. Because what happens with this, if you take the lid off and release it to the air, um, it reacts with the humidity, with the water vapor in the air, and it makes this really dense white cloud. And in World War I, that was an important munition. It was used as a smoke screen, and they also used it in tracer bullets and spotting shells, especially back in World War I. So, so the mining at Dental City was uh, a critical uh, raw material for the munitions industry in World War I. Tracer bullets lighting up the sky. All that titanium shooting over there. And there's a smoke screen. I don't know how those soldiers walk through it because it's a very dense, very thick uh, cloud of, uh, of smoke. But uh, that was what um, ultimately the Middle City was supporting the production of these materials back in World War I. So, how did they? get this stuff from the beach to industry. Well, especially back in those days, uh, railroads were a key transportation uh, element. They still are today, but sort of in different ways. Uh, so uh, the development of rail transport here in Jacksonville and to the Atlantic Ocean Beach was key to uh, the production that went on, uh, the mining that went on down in the city. And I believe it was a couple of years ago that the real historian of railroads uh, for Florida Coast Railway, Mr. Branson, was here. And I believe he gave a talk on how the railroads got to Jacksonville, especially the Florida Coast Railway, and especially the uh, activities of Henry Flagler. He built that railroad and built hotels all up and down the coastline. So Mr. Branson is the real historian. I am not. So for real, uh, accurate, uh, historical information, we can always go to him. What I tell you is uh, what I've observed may, may not be correct or exactly accurate, but uh, I thought it was important to kind of describe the railroads that are interesting to me. And, and Mineral City, what really got my uh, interest about it was I didn't know there was a railroad to Mineral City until I read some old history. Because that tram road, as they called it back then, uh, connected to the Florida East Coast Railway, uh, 
that sort of got my interest up, and that, that's when I started reading about all this. So, in 1850, there were no railroads in Jackson. There weren't many people either, I suspect. By 1875, there were two in the vicinity. Uh, one that was built from Fernandina. It ran all the way across the state to Cedar Key on the Gulf of Mexico. A fellow named Uli, I believe, built that railroad. The town of Uli up here north of Jacksonville is, is named for him. And, and um, that was an important uh, trade route back then. Uh, nothing left of it today, hardly, except for the uh, paper mill, I think, in Fernandina. And there was a railroad from the west that came in from Pensacola and came to Jacksonville from the west side. So that was the extent of uh, trains around here in 1875. <coughs> and lo and behold, in 1888, as Jacksonville started to grow a little bit, there was interest in the beach and <coughs> people being able to get back and forth. They built a railroad called Jacksonville, Mayport, and Pablo Railroad. <coughs> which uh, got the name Jump Man and Bush. The, the infrastructure of that railroad was so poor, so poorly done that the trains kept running off the track, <coughs> the engines kept breaking down, the passengers had to get out and push. <coughs> so, so that's how it got its name. But it, but it ran from Arlington, uh, just south of the river, over to uh, what was Pablo in that day, the place called the Burnside Hotel, maybe you can't see this from the back, and then up to Maple. Um, but that road was so poorly capitalized and so poorly run that it um, met its demise after some years. And I'm not going to go through all the details of this chart, but it kind of tracks uh, the Jump In and Push Road. <coughs> Uh, another one was started, the Arlington and Atlantic Railway Company, which changed its name to the Jacksonville and Atlantic Railway Company. Um, that road was foreclosed on in 1890. It was, became the Jacksonville and Atlantic Railroad Company, <coughs> which was a reincorporation of the other one. Uh, the terminal was moved to the south part of Jacksonville from Arlington in 1892. <clears throat> and then the jump men and push went into receivership in 95. It was shut down. The other road that ran from South Jacksonville over here to Pebble Beach and then up to Mayport um, was running about 1893. Um, the yellow box there is the Jacksonville St. Augustine and Indian River Railway, which was built by Henry Flagler, was renamed Florida's Coast Railway. And the Jacksonville and Atlantic was acquired by the FPC in 1899. The, the point of the slide is that well before Mendel City started, there was rail service right here to the Jacksonville Beach. So that's the railroad I'm talking about, not the red line. That's the jump in and push that went out of business. Uh, the black line here on the left is the one I'm talking about in 86. And by 1909, you see the rest of all the railroads that started in Jacksonville. Uh, and the one we're interested in that became FEC, running from uh, South Jacksonville to Pablo Beach and, and up to Maple. And there was uh, good train service here. There were four uh, round trips a day from Jacksonville, Union Station up in Jacksonville, uh, over here to the beach, and all the way to Mayport. And uh, I could never quite figure this schedule out. <laughs> um, there, there, were, there were trains that left Jacksonville that it looks like it was set up for people who lived here on the beach to go to Jacksonville City and work and come home in the evening. That's the way the schedule looks to me. Because you have trains leaving uh, Mayport at 5.40 a.m., 7.40 a.m., get to Jacksonville an hour later, and two other trains that left Jacksonville at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. coming over here to the beach. So that looks like a commuter railroad for people that lived on the beach side, but 
of work in Jacksonville. The other trains aren't really set up for day trips. I mean, you, you would think people who were retired, if you retired back then, I guess, or on vacation or what have you, might like to catch a train to Jacksonville in the morning and go over here to the beach, spend the day, and go home. <laughs> Well, there's really only one train that was set up to do that. So I, I get into stuff like this. It's just kind of interesting to try to figure out what, what the schedule is, how we mess that up. So the point of all of that is that there was a railroad for, for Mineral City to connect to uh, to haul their products. And uh, you see it up there, the, the Mayport Railroad up at the top. Comes to Pablo Beach, there was a Y here. It made a left turn and went north up to Atlantic Beach and Bayport. And then in 1960, or thereabouts, when Mineral City started working, uh, they built what they called a tram road. It connected right out here, uh, right close to the Pablo Beach station, ran south, and then took a little bend over toward the coast, right, right along the coast. And then down, and then at the bottom there, where you see the where it comes to an end, it looks like there was a sidetrack that actually ran along the beach. And, um, very, very interesting layout and, and interesting operation. I don't know if there are any vestiges of this line left today. I mean, I haven't tried to look for it. I suspect it's all over condos and parking lots. This is the little engine. One of them, uh, hauling a car or two, you see the steam shovel, it's uh, picking up the beach sand, picking it up, putting it in, in the cars, and uh, there's the ocean right behind it. That, that train is on the beach. And I got to thinking, that's not the only one here at Florida. That's not the only train that is run right on the beach. So if you permit a little digression, There's a railroad that runs right on the beach. It's still there today. I don't know if you can see it. But it's going this way. And then, then there's a road just to the west of it. That's the Atlantic Ocean. Anybody know where that railroad is today? Well, I know some of it was in Palm Beach. Yeah, not, but not this one. Oh, okay. Gee, I still stumped everybody. Anybody know where that road is? Is it down at Jensen Beach? No. Kalana? I'm sorry. Is it Kalana Reserve? No. It's not close to, it's in Florida. Cape Canaveral. That's it. Where? Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral. That's that railroad after Hurricane Jesus in 2004. That's how close it was to the ocean. This railroad is part of the NASA railroad. NASA built a railroad to haul rocket parts, rocket engines, um, from the Florida East Coast in Titusville over to Cape Canaveral to the launch pads. This piece of it ran all the way to the ocean, down the beach, to the Air Force launch facilities where the Titan program launched their rockets. For many years, uh, trains hauling uh, pressurized helium cars, specialized cars, <coughs> helium for those uh, rocket launches, ran along this track right along the beach. So it's kind of off topic, but <laughs> I just found it interesting that uh, we had at least two governor blocks in this state that uh, uh, you would have to cross your bare feet to get to the beach. That's another picture of the same track. Th this railroad is out of service today. Uh, the Air Force shut down their Titan pads, and uh, uh, eventually this will probably be taken up. How long ago? 2006 or seven. that kind of time. Well, back to Mineral City. This is their little 040 switcher. Uh, interesting looking piece of equipment, right? The tracks don't look anything like that today. And I heard somebody speculating or asking about, well, they didn't have a coal car. I heard you 
saying that. So what did this thing run on? So where's the coal? Back in the tender car behind us. Didn't have a tender. At least not in the pictures I've seen. Didn't have a tender. Fuel oil? I mean, I don't know the answer. I, I think they burned wood, but I'm not sure. Could have been a fire in a stoker. Maybe they had gas. <laughs> if it was a wood burner, it would have had a thousand bottles. Yeah. Bob, it could have been. It could have been one where they had a steam boiler where they charged it with steam and ran on the steam pressure. They called fireworks cooker. That's a possibility. <laughs> because none of the pictures I've seen showed any uh, tender. Right. You know, the whole color. They also had small just like that. Yeah. I showed this picture, uh, we've seen both of these before, just because they had at least two of these. I, my point is, if you look closely, they're not the same engine. <coughs> so they were running at least two engines on, on the train road to Memphis City. And for all I know, they had more than that. But you can see they're different, the, the cab, See the cab, the windows are different, uh, the front end uh, is different. So uh, they invested in at least two steam locomotives. And there's a picture of the line going from Mendel City up to up here. And somebody's dog. <laughs> but it's it's not a high speed rail line. <laughs> I, I imagine that road pretty rough. But it got the job. And you notice um, it's wild country. Sometimes I think we were all born too late. But then again, you'd be slapping lots of mosquitoes too. <laughs> and that's our time slide, just another shot of the uh, facilities there in the city. Is and that the, right at Ponte Vedra where the old buildings were? We were talking about the location, and I don't know the answer. We suspect that it's where the, the main building is because when yeah. they went to, when all this shut down and they converted over to being a golf course, right. there was land there. I mean, the tailings, you know, gave them the place was it. So that's the speculation, but I don't really know for sure. What were the buildings? Are they processing plants or what, what are they? The, yeah, they, these are plants where they had the shaker tables that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Where they put all the, uh, the mineral sands and put water in them and shake them up. Okay. And uh, they had a bagging operation in there where they take the product and put it in bags, mm -hmm. which were shipped out. And then, then from what I read, they also ship bulk uh, product as well. Uh, I don't know what proportion. So I put this slide together and I said, well, let's call it from Illinite and titanium to titanium. Uh, this is kind of tracks what happened to Venice City. And in 1918, the war was over. The Illinite production declined. It didn't need as much. And in 1922, National Lead bought out Butler and Pritchard. And they didn't mine for Illuminati anymore, or if they did, they didn't. Uh, that wasn't the main product. The main product became the Rutile and Zircon, for, for which new markets were developing. Uh, in, but, in that, but, but even that demand was going down, and it became obvious, I guess, that, that the mining operation uh, was not long for the world. In 1928, a guy named Strong, I think it was Herbert Strong, I believe, but he was an English Englishman, designed a golf course. And it was interesting back then, they didn't have the uh, heavy machine machinery like we have today to uh, tear up the earth. They used a hundred mules to move the earth to 
you know, to build a golf course, to uh, shape the ground, and to uh, haul out what was left in the ponds to create the water hazards and so on. And, and what really drove a state through the heart of Mendel City was in 29, when India and Australia became uh, cheaper sources of these metals. So we ended up uh, outsourcing our, much of our mineral production, even though even today Florida is still a major uh, mining state. But back then, uh, even back then, foreign countries were uh, taking over some of the products we used to make ourselves. So even though National Lead bought out Buckner and Pritchard, uh, they were still associated with the company. And uh, they changed the name of Federal City in 1929. The name went away, became the Potter Beecher Company. Uh, as I understand it, they got that name from a Spanish newspaper that uh, mistakenly Identify the city in Spain as the birthplace of Christopher Columbus. But it turned out that was not the case. But anyway, that's where the name Ponadidra allegedly came from. Uh, 1932, the FEC Railway abandoned the Mayport Ranch. No more railroads to the beach. And of course, that did away with the railroad to the city. <coughs> no more connection to the National System. I don't know when I don't know when the Mayport branch was taken up by the FTC, and I don't know when the Federal City Railroad was taken up. But it was obviously in the early days. As I said, I, I'm not aware of any vestiges left. I don't know if you could go out down here and walk around and see any evidence of an embankment or old cross ties. Rail nails and things like that. I suspect it's all cemented over. Uh, in 42, that whole site was renamed Ponte Vedra Beach and the golf resort era got started. And in the 90s, titanium golf clubs, of all things, were developed and used to play golf on the former site where titanium mining is what we're just to me a very interesting irony in its history unfolding there. So the transformation of the beachfront ilmenite mine for titanium production to titanium usage for sport and recreation was completed. That's the clubhouse as it was in 1927. It's like a long, long building. the clubhouse in 1942, when uh, the golf, golf resort was really just getting going. So that's the golf course. I've never played the golf course there. In fact, I gave the game up quite a long time ago, because I figured I'd never get my golf score for 18 holes down to the national golf score. <laughs> So, like I say, I, I never played the course. But, I have it on good authority. If you go out there early in the morning, or real quiet, and listen very carefully, you will hear the sea whistle of that little engine calling another little engine up here to Pablo Beach. That's my story.
mainly in the dunes, but, but also it looked like back behind the dunes as well. So they were probably drinking a little bit of water table? Uh, they, they, yes, because there were a number of ponds created. And if they're drinking, they usually drink Right. And, and, and the water hazards on the golf course are those ponds. Now they've been reshaped, I'm sure, you know, from the mining days, but, but that's how they got started. Any idea? The depth, the depth to which they crashed? Uh, I don't know. About nine feet. But, but you saw that steam shovel in that one picture? Probably no deeper than the length of the boom on that steam shovel. Or how much they had. As far as the occurrence of these uh, minerals, uh, or how they came to be deposited, obviously if they're in sand, they came from the water. Right. Well, that, that's what I was speculating about. The, the, the world only got here one of two ways. I mean, it got here through an evolutionary process and it started with the explosion in millions of years. Or, or it got here by some creative act of God who put those minerals there. Right? But who, who, through hydrological processes and, and, and water movement, okay, uh, operated or ran sedimentation processes where those minerals were, were concentrated and collected there, really in, in a similar way to how they were recovered through the shaker table. So they were suspended in water, the water flowed over there and it slowly um, drained away, leaving the sediments behind and leaving those mineral deposits in those, I think it said um, roughly 30 centimeters thick a foot or two, more than a foot, a couple of feet thick, concentrated there. And, and that's what they were going after with their, uh, with their mind yes, We were told that the sands came from the Appalachian Mountains. The end that, that's a possibility. If, if you think about macro flooding, meaning flooding over very, very wide areas, it's very possible that, that, that they came from that far away, maybe even far away. I'd like to address that. And that is definitely true. Florida is a result of the degradation of Appalachian Mountains. Uh, in, in Jacksonville, particularly, through the mining process, not mining, dredging process for deepening the channel to cut the Fulton Cut, mm -hmm. the uh, spoils were put out on Blood Island at a close point. You can find moonstone there, and that's not native of Florida, it's native of Appalachian Mountains. So all of that with this mineral deposits came down. Florida's been up and down three times, so yeah. that mineralization of Florida came from that place. And, and those uh, tailings that they dug up to, to deepen the channel, right? Mm -hmm. Is there, is there um, viable mineral deposits there that could be recovered, or is it just not enough? As far as a, a hill that I Well, that or anything else that they've got. Uh, nothing of significant value. That's the most valuable product in this area. Yeah. Yes, what was the total value of the yield that I've taken out, do you know? I don't know. Uh, in today's money, I'm sure it's probably uh, probably billions of dollars in today's money. It wouldn't have been like that. <clears throat> but they, that mine worked from 1916 to, what did I say, 1922 or 1924. So it ran for, what, eight years. Uh, but I really don't know the volumes that were removed or how to put a dollar value on it, but the United States government <coughs> deemed it to be critical material. Uh, so they, for the duration of World War I, the, the government said, you guys keep buying it. <coughs> and they were buying all of that that they could produce. It was the only, only uh, way the titanium could be recovered at the time? Uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, back in those days, that's how it was recovered, yeah. Because you had to separate it out from, from the worthless quartz deep sand. You know? So the, the, I don't know how else you would do that. Yes. Is it true that Buckman and Cassara may know this? Buckman and Pritchard own the land that's adjacent to the Regency Center, all those white sands that uh, used to go That was the Humphreys Mine. That, that was a that was Humphreys mine. mine. That was a lead company that uh, owned Humphreys Mine. The lead mine. company? Okay. And they mined all the way from. from uh, 
down down Southside Boulevard to yeah. approximately Deerwood. Okay. They mined a whole strand of sand there. From Regency, that From area. Right, yeah, where that, you was, that was a titanium sand. mine. That's called the Skinner Track. Yeah. It was, it was finished in the 1960s. Yeah. And the first and Deerwood, the gated community, is built on the tailings. Yeah. But the, when were they mining that? 1960. I think they closed yeah. the Skinner Track, I believe, if I remember right, it was finished in 1964. Right. That. But wow. were they mining there when we were mining at the beach here? No. 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 1940s. Yeah. Late 40s. Late 40s. And there's still mining operations in McClenny. There's yeah. still the, the uh, trail bridge, the trail ridge mine is still mining titanium in the McClenny area. Okay. DuPont owns it. It's now the Morris Company. I'm sorry. It's now the Morris Company. DuPont spun I think, off. Yeah, I don't know who owns yeah. it now. So now the Morris has spun off from DuPont, and the trail ridge mine, the Highland mine, both closed, the Maxwell mine is the only one that's still. Operational, they mine about 2,000 tons an hour with the dredge, and then wow. they have several uh, dry operations going along with it yeah. at this point. Question back here. guys didn't dig up, it's still out there. <laughs> but like I said, it's probably mostly paved over underneath your condo. <laughs> you could still mine Amelia Island if you had the money to buy Amelia Island. <laughs> it's still a mineable quantity of titanium up there. Yeah, because it's part of that yeah. stretch of beach. That nobody could, it's not, you couldn't make enough money off of which the titanium. Yeah. You'd never get a permit. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody wants to get a collect collect a sample at Dickler's Landing, go to the beach and go south about 100 feet. There's a very high concentration of heavy mineral sand there. Yeah. And the black sand, I found out, is a half a time heavier than white beach sand. Yeah. It, even, uh, even on my beach, and I live in Melbourne, Florida, down the coast, and even on our beach, not even on the dune, just go out on the beach with the swim and pick up a handful of sand you look closely, every so often there's a little black speck in there. And, and you know, it's not real high concentration, but, but no matter where you pick up a handful, every so often there's a little black speck that built on it. Uh, Nicholas is two to three inches thick, not just black. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's all along the coast. Uh, every beach has it in Florida. But like we were saying, it's just this stretch here in, the, in northeast Florida that had the back in those days. You know the, uh, the viable amounts that made it worthwhile. Cost effective. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob, during the war, World War One, I think I read that only Germans were allowed to go into the Northern Yeah, and, and another interesting thing about Germany, and this goes back to the railroad. When Flagler built his railroad from Miami to Key West, which he started in 1912, I believe it was, yeah. the, he, he built uh, something like 35 or 40 miles of bridges across the ocean. Okay, not enough land to build all these bridges. Well, the supports for those bridges in in the ocean water was German cement. And the only place they could get the cement that would work in salt water was from Germany. They brought eight shiploads, if you can think of that, in the 19-teens, of this special German cement that, that had to be mixed with fresh water to make the slurry, you know, the cement slurry. And then for, <coughs> for the uh, supports, in salt water, they, they would put in a, uh, a uh, caisson, pump all the ocean water out, fill that with the German cement, uh, mixed with fresh water that they had trouble getting in the Keys because there was no wells that produced enough. They actually hauled it down in cypress tanks from, from the Everglades. Um, 
pour the cement in there, uh, take the forms away, and that German cement would cure underwater, under salt water, even though it had to be mixed with fresh water to do that. Those supports are still there today. Holding up, even though the bridge is out of service, they built all new bridges, but those supports are still working today. And in fact, some of them are still in service on the main line of the railroad down, down in central Florida. Uh, that, those bridges were built in the 1920s. They're just as good today as they were back then. So the German, the German cement is a sideline to your company, uh, played an important role in the in building the railroads back then. We have mining experts here, so <laughs> go ahead and throw your questions up. Yes? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't really know, but I think it was in the dozens. That was, that's a guess. I think employment was probably more than a few and less than a hundred. And actually, it wouldn't surprise me, maybe you guys know better, but they probably had quite a turnover of employment. I mean, that, that wasn't a resort back then. That, that was mosquito country, and it was hot in the summer. So I'd be willing to bet, I'm guessing. <laughs> that they had a big something called a fulgurite. When a 3,000 bolt, what, would you open that please? When 3,000 uh, bolts of electricity hits the beach, it forms a nice rock called a fulgurite, which can be found on our beaches. It's just very hard to find them because they crumble and people don't realize what they're finding. But if you'd like to come up and see that and look at the samples I've got to show you. Thank you. What's the Ajax? Ajax is calcium carbonate, which is pearl, yeah. and it's also these shells. Okay. Ajax, you're scrubbing your shell, you're scrubbing your beach with Ajax. 